What is up everybody, Everyday Angler here. I'm here with Joey. Uh, recently been fishing with him like three times now and I thought it'd be really cool to do an interview. Um, I did one with John in the past so I'm trying to kind of keep up and do little interviews with everybody I fish with. So I guess first we could get to know him a little better so uh, why don't you tell the subscribers a little bit about yourself. All right, so uh, I'm from the Chattanooga area. I uh, left, I joined the army for like eight years and uh, had a good time doing that. When I got out, I kind of picked up fishing again and started fly fishing. It was something I always wanted to do. And, um, so, you know, I started on the salt marsh down in Savannah, Georgia, then started with, then went on to North Georgia waters. I've gone a little bit out west. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just a little bit of everything. That wasn't really about me. That I just yeah. went straight into fishing. That's fine. Okay. So how exactly did you get into fly fishing? So, uh, man, I started fly fishing probably about two or three years ago. Um, I'd moved to Cumberland Island, Georgia to live on the island for six months and volunteer for the National Park Service. And this guy came and was like, you live here and don't fish. I'm like, well, what would I fish for? And he's like, dude, fly fishing for redfish is like the best thing you can do here. And I was like, so I went and bought a fly rod and started trying it and it was horrible. I had no idea how to cast or anything like that and uh, that's how I started and I eventually moved up to kind of waters that I was more familiar with in Chattanooga and started fishing like flat lakes and got my cast down and really kind of intertwined the idea of fly fishing with what I already knew with um, I'd yeah. been fishing my probably since I was five or so so I just kind of intertwined the that knowledge with the new practice of fly fishing yeah I think that's a that's one of the biggest things when you're thinking about going to fly fishing. A lot of people just think, I've got to drive to the mountains, you know, I've got to go fish for wild fish and trout. And uh, really, the best thing to do is just go do what you would normally do. Just do it with a fly rod. Uh, that's a lot what I do on my channel, you know. I've fished a lot of the same spots like with ultralight spinning gear. Now I'm just doing it with a fly rod. So that brings up the next question of... Uh, do you have like any advice or tips for people that are think they want to start fly fishing and just aren't too sure or you know they don't really have anybody there to help them out with it yeah i think you kind of hit the nail on the head there um you know if you want to get into fly fishing the best thing you can do is just drop your spinning rod replace it with a fly rod and yeah. stick start with the waters that you know i mean if yeah. it's if it's just catching tiny panfish, you know there's nothing wrong with that which there's nothing wrong with <laughs> You know, we did that today. Yeah, and it was well, we great. got some. We got, we got some, some good stuff fish, too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, start with what you know, and then just slowly start to learn more. Start learning how to fish smaller cold water streams. Learning how to nymph. Learn about dry droppers. Learn, uh, you know, go to local uh, fly shops, and they always want to have like question and answer conversations with the locals and people starting out. You know, that that's how I did it. I I think that's how mostly everyone does yeah. it, unless you have like a parent. Unless you're like born into like yeah. your dad fly fish, which I think, I mean, definitely not my situation, no. not yours. And uh, there's, you can definitely kind of tell when somebody was, has only fly fished, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a big difference. And uh, that brings up something that was a little bit for me when I first got started, because a lot of people, those of you that have been with the channel for a while, but a lot of people don't know, I didn't really transition from bass fishing to fly fishing I went from like bait fishing to fly fishing which is two completely different things right and uh, kind of the the fly shop atmosphere gets a little bit of drama sometimes yeah. um, which I've only had one experience and it's been good here in Chattanooga and uh, I'm meaning to visit Hiwassi and Teleco and all that but when you walk into a fly shop it's true I've kind of did a little video on the weight of the rods the 5x 7x all these tippet stuff all these different hook sizes and you know what would you recommend to somebody do you think they should maybe do a little of their own research or just go straight into the fly shop i mean it, me personally i'm the kind of person that's just going to go right in and ask questions yeah um, and that's kind of what i did and there is like this kind of dilemma with walking into a fly shop not knowing anything like the culture of fly fishing isn't really elitist at all but you do run into people yeah that can kind of you know rub you the wrong way if you don't know anything and you know so i i think the best thing to do is both do some you know 
do some research on your own, write down some questions and take that to somebody in a fly shop and be like, this is what I want to do. You know, have an idea of what you want to start with. If you want to start with, you know, small brook trout creeks in the northern, like in the high elevation Appalachians, you know, let them know that. Or if you want to, you know, be on the lakes trying to get bass and smallmouth or panfish, like let them know that. Yeah, especially now. I mean, I just got into it, but I feel like fly fishing has evolved so much to the point where you could almost pursue your favorite species doesn't matter what it is with a fly rod um even crazy stuff i've watched like youtube videos of guys nymphing for catfish at the dam like you can do whatever you want with a fly rod and uh i guess now that we got through that here's a pretty tricky question um why What's why are we fly fishing instead of just going out there with worms or you know with a crankbait or something yeah, this is a interesting conversation. Um, a lot of people have a, diff a lot of different opinions on it. Me personally, um, I like, I, I get hobbies and then I try to get extremely technical with them. And I didn't really get that with yeah. spinning rods. And, you know, it's pretty cut and dry and not to put any, not, not putting that down at all. It can get very technical and uh, you have to learn so much to be a competitive, competitive spinning rod anglers yeah, like I don't, the, the bass guys that yeah have like eight rods for they have a rod for every bait they want to throw yeah but yeah. It, it's just not where my interests lied um yeah i don't know i everyone kept telling me how technical fly fishing was how much you have to learn how every you know can change day to day creek to creek so you can be on one side of a mountain and a fly pattern will work and you yeah. go to the other side and the fish don't like that pattern because it might not exist there or um you can't you know you might not if there's no hatch, don't use a dry fly, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, and I think every, like, um, more experienced fly angler that I've talked to has told me, like, you'll never learn everything. Yeah. You know, so, like, what you said about if, if you're, like, that guy that gets a hobby and just has to, like, get super nerdy about it, that's kind of, like, what fly fishing is because you learn to cast. You start catching fish. Then you start learning about your leader setups. Then you're like, oh, I need to get my fly down deeper. So you have to learn how to cast sinking line, which I really haven't done yet. And then, you know, once you master it all that, there's a whole fly tying thing. Yeah. And the fly tying thing is just like a whole another crazy aspect of it. Um, a lot of people are like, there's nothing like catching a fish on a fly that you tied. I really don't even think it's about that for me. I just enjoy when I'm not fishing, I can still do fishing stuff at home, you know, right, yeah. and that's mostly what it's about for me. And it's just fun coming up with like different patterns and um, you can name them. I name mine. I know there's like, that's a whole nother thing, mm -hmm. you know, with people kind of, oh, that pattern is somebody else's. And uh, it's one thing that I think that there's definitely something that has not been invented yet, but there's so many people tying flies, you know, that somebody out there has tied an ugly bugger. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably called something else and it's fishing it, you know? And it's just like, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, it's just get out there. And, but we're not talking about fly tying. Anyways. Yeah. And, well, another, you mentioned casting. You, men yeah. you mentioned like learning about how to tie flies. Another part of fly fishing to me is you almost become like a naturalist. Like yeah. you have to, you, you know, when you really get into it, you learn so much about how trout eat, how they feed, what they like, what they don't like the insects that live in that area, how to find them, see what time of year these insects hatch, what stages are they in, you know, what are the fish eating right now? And to me, that's extremely interesting. Yeah. And one thing for me, the, ever since I've gotten into fly fishing too, is uh, I've learned to read water yeah. so much better because, and I know this is gonna make sense to some of y'all and some of y'all might not, well, with spinning gear, uh, with spinning gear, you cast your lure out. It's either a popper that floats or it's gonna sink, you know. And you can you can kind of drift stuff and and do stuff like that. But with fly fishing, when your fly line is sitting on a current of water and one part of it is way out here and the other one is way out here, you learn to read that water and stuff that you kind of just would have walked by and not noticed before, you know. And then you you start catching fish and you're like, oh yeah, there's definitely a fish in there in places that you know, when you're spin fishing, you don't even really think about it, you know, like that Kusa bass, like yeah. 
he was literally just hiding under a little i mean there was some foam there yeah yeah it, it was it definitely you know it had a back eddy with foam coming out of a riffle there was going to be something there i just didn't know what it was yeah we thought it was a big rock bass <laughs> um i know you guys have already watched that video so we're actually filming this after we just got done fishing and uh that was crazy that's a whole nother thing that we didn't even know that species of fish was in here so that was pretty crazy yeah all right guys so this interview is going to be a little different in the fact that we are going to get a little nerdy you know we both really love fishing so i know some of y'all will enjoy it and some of y'all really won't care for it but anyways <laughs> um the whole time we were fishing back and forth we were talking about because i really don't know anything about trout i'm like i know where the warm water species are going to be sitting like we uh, talked about reading the water and he was telling me well if this was a trout stream this is where the trout would be sitting so i guess we can dive a little deeper into that and uh one of the things that he brought up was generally the warm water species are not going to be in the riffle they're going to be in the slower water behind it or beside it and the trout would be sitting in those riffles right yeah uh, i mean trout do sit outside the riffles and they do sit in slower water but specifically the creek we're on today i was pointing out places like yeah if this if there were trout in here they'd be sitting there eating they wouldn't have to move at all they have good you know they have a good place to hide they have cover right there because trout are always thinking like okay if i get attacked where can i go yeah. where can i eat and where do i have to not expend energy and the warm water fish are just different you know you don't find that um i mean they would you say they're a lot more aggressive i i don't know about you know aggressive um i w or they just don't really care they're gonna eat it if they want to or I would say that, or are we talking about warm? Yeah. Yeah, I think that the warm water fish, um, well, if, if we're, first, if we're talking panfish, you know, I think it's kind of cut and dry. They're gonna eat something. It doesn't have to be displayed perfectly. It doesn't have to be something that exists in that creek at all. I mean, you can catch panfish on yeah. a leaf. You can yeah, put yeah, a hook yeah. on a leaf and jig it around enough, it, they'll, they'll catch it. The small, like the, the bass, they get a little more picky, but they're really aggressive. They wanna hit things they hit frogs they hit mice they hit um bait fish and then yeah. if you're talking trout you know some trout if you get to especially like pressured areas you know they won't take anything that's not natural to that creek hatching that not maybe not hatching that day but moving around that day if it's in the um like the nymph stage the larva stage emerger stage or it's actually hatching and flying off the top of the water if that's not happening right then they won't take it so it's really cool to see the difference between these warm water and cold water fish. But what we were kind of talking about is how me and him uh, were kind of walking upstream, reading the water together, pointing out stuff like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I think that's kind of how you learn. Yeah, and it's always kind of funny because um, Joey's obviously like trout. You know, he, he knows about his trout and we would be casting at totally different things. Like me, I'm in the middle of the creek casting at like fallen logs and rocks. And he would be like in the middle of the creek just hitting some little riffle that I would have not even thought to fish, you know? And we were both catching fish. So it's just the different ways people think, you know, when it comes to the species of fish. Um, I have a little, sometimes I have like a little theory of why the trout are the way that they are. And you can tell me what you think about this. So they live in high elevation, you know, cold water streams where bugs, I mean, in the West, I guess there's like constantly a hatch. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a seasonal yeah. thing, yeah. So there, I think like a fish's mind is like, is that food or is that not? And that's really it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, it think, if it thinks your fly is food, it's gonna eat it. And so the trout are very selective because like you said, they're seasonal hatches, they know if the little bug is always green and you're throwing something blue, they know. Uh, I think that the warm water species, well, panfish, will, heat, will hit anything because I think they're constantly eating the same things, I guess. Or, you know, there's not really like a seasonal hatch, maybe. I think, it, you know, I can only give a best guess here on panfish, but I would imagine that their intelligence is not at the level of a bass or... Yeah. Um, definitely not a trout and they're Man, very hurting my feelings i know i know <laughs> i'm sorry for all the panfish fans i mean i love i mean that's why we came here yeah you know, yeah like yeah. let's get panfish i'm like right on but uh i would say it their level of 
impulsivity. Is that a word? Yeah, like they'll see something and they just want to hit it. They're yeah. not thinking like, wait a second. Usually that bug is green and today is yeah. blue. Maybe I shouldn't eat it. Yeah. You know, they're just like. Whereas like, you know, you talk about trout. Well, hatchery trout are going to eat a lot more than like a wild trout. Yeah. And then going back to the color of what's in this, the trout might see whatever coming through the riffle or bouncing off the bottom and it might say, okay. I don't know that color, but I'm going to try it anyway. And then it'll, it will literally feel it around in its mouth. And if it doesn't feel like that thing, it'll spit it out. Like they, they're very smart and picky about how they, how they eat. And as they get older, they get bigger, they get smarter. You know. And we are talking about wild fish. Yeah. Because yeah, we are talking. you can go catch stalkers just like you would panfish. That's like the only trout I've caught have been stalkers. And when I first, I went with spinning gear at the Hiwassee. And when I first went over there, I was like, why the hell are these trout guys like, you know, <laughs> making such a big deal about this? I was literally throwing anything and they were eating it. But then you learn that these fish are like pretty much fed like pellets. Yeah. Like, you know, every, I mean, you can go to the hatcheries and watch them feed. It's a machine that just casts yeah. pellets out over the water. And you so, know, they get in the stream and learn how they learn a more natural way of eating. But they still have that. Anything, yeah. yeah. They do get big, but they don't really fight hard. At yeah. least from what I've noticed. I don't know. They kind of just, when they get hooked, they'll give you a little tug and then they just kind of give up. Yeah, they kind of do that. Yeah, and that might just be because, you know, the cold water here in the areas that I fish doesn't really hold over very well. Mm -hmm. And they get like really, like warm water is not good for trout, you know, so that might be another thing too. So another thing that is might be a little overwhelming when you're getting into fly fishing is just all these flies, right? Uh, there's a lot of lures and there's a lot of soft plastics in spin fishing, but the flies just get kind of crazy with the amount Yeah, and they get tiny, you know I don't really throw a lot of tiny stuff because of what like the areas that I fish I'll just be pulling flies out of fish's throats all the time, but We're gonna break down a little bit of what I use today and what he used today Pretty much just some basic patterns that'll get you on most fish that you don't really have to think about too much so for me um I wouldn't say like I'm a streamer junkie, but I mostly fish streamers just because that's more of what I'm used to with the spinning gear, right? Yeah. It's like the easiest thing to, that kind of makes sense to me before I'm trying to like drift a nymph or something like that. I would rather just cast a woolly bugger and strip it back to me. And that's probably, if I would say, if you could have like a couple of flies, just make sure a woolly bugger is one of them because I've caught... I would literally just fish with woolly boogers when I first started fly fishing and I would catch like all the species I wanted on it. So I guess you can tell them a little bit more about your setup that you use today. Yeah. So I'm the opposite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I will, I, no matter where I go, time of year, whatever, I'm always going to put something on top of the water first. And a lot of people, and it doesn't make sense, will tell you that makes no sense. Yeah. But I do it because that's what I like to see. I love see, to see a fish hit the top. I will try the top water for like 30 minutes at least. And I know, I know most of the time I'm doing that, I'm not going to get fish, especially, you know, if I'm fishing for trout, but, um, I always give it a shot, especially with warm water fish. And that's what I did today. Yeah. I had on like an inch and a half big foam ant and probably a dropper. I don't know what it was. It had like a emerald colored no, it was a stone fly. I was using, okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I had this beautiful dropper on. It wasn't doing anything for me. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the stone fly. It's the most reliable fly for me when it comes to warm water fishing. It, I mean, it, to a fish, it looks a lot like a woolly bugger. It, you're, we're essentially talking about it the same thing here. It just looks like something buggy. Yeah. It's, that's that's it's, my thing with tying the ugly flies. It's just something that has a little fuzz, has some silly legs on it. Something that they want to eat, you yeah, know, yeah. when it comes to panfish, like warm water fish like that. Uh, so I guess just a few patterns Yeah, I mean, to get people out and catching fish, whether it's, I know trout can be a little picky, but you know, yeah. the panfish and stuff, you know. Well, let, let's start, okay, lakes, warm water lakes in the uh, southeast. Lakes. Yeah, there's I mean, we else. got like woolly bugger, stonefly, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> anything that imitates like a wounded bait fish. Yeah. Any streamer. I mean, that, that's like, that's good. Uh, I just keep saying the woolly bugger. Yeah, I, I'm, he's not going to stop saying that. Yeah, because <laughs> ugly bugger, no. Yeah, yeah. The, when we were, the first time we went fishing and he was kind of 
opening my eyes up to the whole nymphing thing, I didn't have any nymphs. And I was just using my woolly bugger, and it was doing... I was catching fish yeah. on it. it. The woolly bugger, you can strip it and imitate a bait fish, or you can, like, nymph it, and it could almost imitate a stonefly or a helgramite. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it's very it's versatile. Fish. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess woolly bugger. And for top water patterns, I mean... Any kind of... Uh caddis fly or anything with some elk hair in it um you can do the you can go the foam route um yeah. the foam route's really good for like waters where they're not going to be too picky they're not the bigger foam things i just don't think are very natural looking yeah and, um but i i like i i do a hopper dropper in warm water creeks um it gives you the opportunity to get a fish that's going to get that wants to hit the top water like the coosa bass yeah <laughs> Well, and I then, use foam because, like I said, I'm. They're small flies, but compared to some trout flies, they're pretty big. Yeah. Like the smallest thing I'll throw is a size ten, and a lot of these little dry flies won't hold up these nymphs, you know. Yeah. And you know, it's panfish, it's bass. They're not too picky, and the foam is just, for me, is a lot more resilient. Mm -hmm. Oh it's, yeah. It's gonna float high. It's gonna stay up. You know, a lot of these natural dry flies they get after a while they start to sink because you know it's hair and it gets water in it but they're definitely better for like a more delicate presentation yeah and you know doing the warm water creeks like we've done today you know you you really can get a lot away with a lot yeah you know you don't have yeah. to it doesn't have to look natural it doesn't no. have to you know have a good presentation you kind of just throw something out there that you think is going to work if you catch a fish in the first five minutes just, keep keep yeah, doing just it. Keep it on there. And we had um, we had the the foam ant patterns. We had you had a woolly bugger. I had a purple ugly bugger. Yeah, pur purple ugly bugger. Like it was not natural at all. Stonefly. Yeah, stonefly uh, nymphs. I had a at the beginning. I had an elk hair uh, caddis of some kind. It was just brown. Probably the ugliest thing I've ever seen. I've my, the first fish I caught was on a mop fly. Yeah. So I'm like very. <laughs> I guess people call them like trashy flies like you know I just think they're fun man bluegill panfish will hit about anything so yeah I mean the, I think the key is to just kind of going back to stick with what you know like if you if you um, fish like a chartreuse you know plastic bait yeah. for smallmouth on some creek we'll go buy like a chartreuse colored minnow or fly woolly bugger, yeah, or woolly bugger yeah and it's gonna be the same thing to the fish yep so now um, it's late summer, early fall. You guys can kind of see the leaves are starting to die. The fishing is about to get rough, at least for the type of fish that I try to catch, right? Because we talked about how panfish will hit anything, but in the winter, it's tough. Like, uh, so I guess, what are you looking to do in the winter when it does get tough? And uh, I know you talked a little bit about starting to nymph more yeah so uh in the winter time you won't you will not catch me on um a river yeah. with sink tip pulling woolly buggers around or streamers or um i want to uh i'll be going to higher elevation like i really want to work on finding some good eastern brook trout uh, high elevation streams on the tennessee carolina border southern virginia um, right now i have a four weight that i can nymph with um, but I really want to get an actual nymphing rod which you usually see in three to four weight 10 feet to 11 and a half feet that's a whole nother game man. and um, I, I, I had I was fortunate enough to fish alongside some competitive anglers here in North Georgia but also out in Washington and just watching how effective uh, nymphing is it just and having done a little bit myself in Montana with a good friend um, it's kind of like the next thing for me. Yeah. I mean, I'd never really saw trout in my future, you know, but... It's in your future. <laughs> if the panfish gets rough, I might just go up to the mountains and... Because that, is that really when trout thrive? Or do they, do I mean, they not you, like it too cold either? So, my experience with um, late fall, wintertime trout fishing is... Um, it can be a little cold for them, so... Um, when the sun starts hitting the water in the mornings and like midday, it's kind of like fishing, um, 
you know, a, a summer morning. Yeah. You know, when the when the when it starts to heat up, the warmest the water temperature is that day is when you're going to catch them. Um, you definitely probably won't be getting a lot on top water. I don't think I've ever caught. Oh, there's, no, there's no bugs. There's no in bugs. Water, yeah, yeah it, it, they're looking for um, the the larvae that are in their casings and coming out of their casings or um, at that at that point. But um, so uh, you know, after you know November first, I if Julio here tries to take me on anything that's considered warm water fishing, I'm gonna say no. Yeah, and I'm gonna drag I'm gonna drag him up somewhere high, and we're gonna go find some trout. If that's where the fish are, I'll go. You know, we all know how winter, it, I mean, it gets rough. Like, it just gets rough. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, if you want, if you're, if you're fishing late fall lakes for smallmouth and, yeah. you know, that October time frame, early November can be great for smallmouth. Um, but it, it's just, it's not where my interests lie, yeah. you know, but I know a lot I, of people I love want, it. Yeah, I want to get on some bass. I mean... We tried to show y'all a little bit bigger fish on this channel. It just didn't work out. <laughs> we got a nice one today though. And, I, uh, I did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> and uh, it's so, I've been messaging him back and forth. I'm like, yo, we gotta go catch these Kusa bass and all this stuff. And this is a creek that I've fished, I don't know how many times and he catches one in there. So it's something else. Let me make sure that didn't. Yeah, it sounded like it just, that was 30 minutes exactly. All right, sorry if the camera cut off right there. Uh, we're on a loop anyways. Um, this is gonna be the kind of exit question. Um, something that I've noticed a lot online ever since I've gone into fly fishing, obviously the trout thing is huge in fly yeah. fishing. It's mm -hmm. the primary thing in fly fishing. Not only that, but there's this whole aspect of uh, keep them wet, you know, help the fish. Conservation is a big aspect of fly fishing. And down here in the south, I just think it's kind of funny that we're stalking fish. A lot of these, you know, conservation groups and stuff work to stalk fish in places where they're going to die every summer. And whether it's for people to harvest them or for recreational use, uh, I just think it's a little counterproductive. Now, I'm very new to the whole thing. So take that, you know, with a grain of salt. But that's just one thing that I can't help but notice. And sometimes I feel like other fish, like my little panfish, don't get a lot of love. <laughs> and they live here all the time. You know, they survive the winter, they survive the summer. But no, we're gonna go put a bunch of these rainbow trout in here. They're gonna be they're gonna be dead in two months. So these guys can go post Instagram pictures <laughs> with them. You know, so like yeah. what do you think about that? I think it's a huge debate. It's gotten into the political realm. You definitely said something that's very true. Like outdoorsmen kind of were the first conservationists. I, and I think that's key. Like I kind of touched on earlier, you almost become like an effective fly fisherman. It's kind of a naturalist of the fly fishing, you know, the creeks and whatever. But um, yeah, um, I, I don't agree with, um, you know, that creeks and streams and rivers get stocked for many different reasons. I know in the Chattanooga Southeast area, they, TWRA does stock trout in streams where they cannot live for more than five to six months. And there's exceptions, but there are, for the there, most part. There are, but uh, they're, most, they're put in there for recreational purpose only. And um, I don't agree with that. I don't think that, you know, every 10 year old needs to be able to catch a trout in his hometown. Like, because that's kind of what, T that's kind of what they they hop on they harp on when stocking. Yeah. Oh, this is for like kids to learn how to frit fish, and I'm like, yeah, they should. But you know, go travel, put in the put in the time, put in the effort to go catch these fish where they're wild, because you stock you stock these hatchery fish into streams with wild fish, and they out eat the wild yeah. fish, and then eventually the wild population goes down. And they've proved this to be true out in Washington and Montana. They've stopped. Um, putting hatchery fish in wild streams and now the wild fish are flourishing and I really don't think you know if it if it's to save an entire ecosystem um, yeah sure stock it but like generally it, it seems to be a negative thing in my eyes and I'm no I'm I am no expert um, but the conversations I've had 
kind of make me want to say like don't stock fish where they can't live it just makes sense to me um and i and i know some people get caught in the middle of that like fly shop owners for instance they they're conservationists and they can kind of see that side of the coin but the other side of the coin is cells like i need recreational fishermen um again i don't agree but um it's also only my opinion you know especially for me um that's another reason why i really just kind of promote the fact that i'm really trying to bring in people into fly fishing and show them that it's you can definitely go do the wild fish thing and the stock trout thing but you can go fly fishing for panfish and bass and all yeah. this stuff you know it's uh those are wild fish yeah i mean if you you're, know it's if you're in the chattanooga area yeah and you stay here year round 90 percent of your and you're active fly fishing 90 yeah. percent of your fishing is going to be warm water fish yeah unless you can travel up to the mountains every weekend or north georgia but. yeah and that's just something to leave you guys with to think about yeah think about uh, it. for those of you that have stuck around this long and uh we appreciate you for watching i'm going to leave a link to joey's instagram so you guys can go ahead and give him a follow in the description below and i uh, hope you guys enjoy this little interview we talked about a lot of things got off subject a lot but thank you for watching everybody and stay tuned for next week's episode of the everyday angler i can do my intro real quick oh you want to pause here let me go